What color is it? Blue. You're sure? Positive. So what was the color? Blue. I guess the color really doesn't matter. Let's try it again. Here we go. What color is it? Red. red. You're sure that it's red? Yes. I appreciate you still speaking up. It's amazing how many people would say that this yellow handkerchief is red. Or maybe it's yellow and red. So what do you think? Is it red or is it yellow? Now you don't want to commit yourself, do you? That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll try it again. Here we go. So, so what color is the handkerchief? Yellow. Thank you. He spoke up. He said it was yellow. Anybody over there want to commit yourself? Yes? No? You know better then. Okay, well, uh, here we go. We'll try this. So this should help. So what color is it? Yellow. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> Anti-gravity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought I'd let you in on one of my secrets today. That's anti-gravity. A wand, black in the middle, white on the ends. How many would agree the wand is black in the middle, white on the ends? I'm glad you agree, but actually it looks like a great big rainbow of color to me. And audiences usually go crazy when they see that. I mean, you would not believe how loud they applaud when they see something like that. So now the question is, how good is your memory? Here's a hat. There's the front. There's the back. So we'll test your memory. What was the first color you saw? Blue. Good job. Just John back there knew. Great job there. So we'll try it again. Okay. okay. What was the next color you saw? Red. Red. Yes, but what happened to the red one? It turned yellow. Very, very good. So we'll get that there. And um, maybe we should do something different. Something's missing, don't you agree? I mean, this is a hat. Something's missing, don't you agree? Okay, but you're not sure what it is? Yeah, very, very good, John. That's right, that's right. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you've just witnessed a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. The day, the day is nearly complete. Now we'll see how well you're paying attention. So, um, this is an interesting question for grown-ups. They don't always look at things like they should. Grown-ups tell me what color was the hat? Black. Black. You're sure? You're right, but it really doesn't matter. <laughs> now, have you seen enough color? No. Yes? No? no Don't. No, no. <laughs> Jim's, Jim's not satisfied. <laughs> We've got more for you. Hopefully, sooner or later, you will see a color you like. More and more and more. But now let me tell you what I really want you to see. I'm here today to talk to you about someone who can change our lives and give everlasting hope. His name is Jesus Christ. This isn't a picture of Jesus. Nobody knows exactly what Jesus looked like. But it's something that helps us remember that there is someone who came to this world to live as God in the human form so he could die on the cross, make it possible for us to be forgiven, have a wonderful life in this world, and a life that truly is everlasting. That's a reason to clap your hands and cheer. Okay. okay. So I will slide that out of the way. And this is going to be an interesting day for me with the clicker. There it is. I've got all this paraphernalia. So that um, was, a, you might say, well, that, what does that have to do with technology? But actually, what you just saw had to do, had much to do with technology. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to tell me what, uh, what tech, related to technology, what applied to what you just saw. But first, I seem to me appropriate to have Marvin Roy as the, uh, the poster child for this lecture. Because long before anybody was really even thinking about technology and magic, Marvin Roy came up with this marvelous routine based on light bulbs and did some absolutely incredible things. Marvin was my mentor, my teacher, still my friend. And uh, he really was ahead of his time with the idea of instead of being frustrated with how technology seems to be changing magic, let's embrace it. And that is what Marvin did. Now, I'm um, giving you the clue, and then let's go beyond that. So what you just saw, technology, obviously there was sound, started and stopped at the right time. What else do you think of? How else was the technology involved in what we just experienced? You haven't had a chance to think about it, have you? Okay. Well, there had to be equipment to play the sound. Okay. What else comes to your mind? Remote control. Remote control. Okay, yeah, I did the little clicker to get the thing going. Um, there was a microphone for my voice. I was speaking to you. So the mic was amplifying my voice. 
there was the display on the video screen uh, while it was happening. Um, there was lighting that allowed me to be seen. And these are just basics. But technology is a modern reality that we as performers cannot escape. It's become such a critical element of society that no longer can we say, that stuff isn't for me, I'm too old to bother with it. And one day I caught myself doing that. I was having trouble with my computer. I decided the way to solve the problem was with my usual method. So I said to Mary, we need to call our 16-year-old neighbor. <laughs> he can come over and fix this. And uh, it's strange, because I still remember specifically when it happened, and I heard myself saying it, and I realized what it meant. And that is, in terms of technology, I'd given up on myself. I had bought into the idea that my generation is not able to successfully function in this current generation. And then I said to myself, do I really want that to be true? Do I want to be a self-made dinosaur? Uh, do I want to accept the idea that I become something similar to an obsolete piece of machinery? Do I want to think Dwayne Laughlin and eight-track tape players belong in the same category? <coughs> and I will tell you, I had an eight-track tape player when I was a senior in high school, and I thought I was really cool. But anyway, my heart responded to those questions with a loud no. I'm not ready to move to the sidelines of life, and when it comes to ministry, I'm not done yet. I'm not close to being done yet. Therefore, like it or not, at this new stage in my life, I have to learn some new things. I've already learned a lot. I've done a lot. If you're curious, I'm 64 years old. But I still have to face the fact that if I care about getting God's truth out to this current generation, I have to keep on learning and doing this means I must pay attention to technological tools. I must learn to use them. They are tools which can tremendously enhance our abilities to entertain and communicate. More than that, modern audiences expect us to use them. And if we don't use them, there are places where our credibility will be questioned. At this particular point in history, it is the age of di digital devices and personal media. We're foolish if we don't take advantage of the technology. By the way, if you want to know the rest of the story on that day, I did not call a teenager. Instead, I used Google and YouTube, and it took me a long time, and I'm not one to curse, but I was tempted a few K times along the way. Uh, but eventually, I figured out how to solve the problem. But something else happened, and that is I realized what I was doing to myself. That I was saying, I'm too old to learn that. I didn't, when I went to high school, there were nobody had a computer. And, uh, you know, the whole idea, even a phone, the modern generation can't relate to that, but I remember when phones hung on the wall, and there was a cord and this sort of thing. But anyway, I had to say, well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to give up on myself. I, I, instead, I am going to progress. So I actually gave myself the task, every, I, you know, heard, we have New Year's resolutions, every year I give myself one new major aspect of technology to learn. I give myself a whole year to do it. The young kids could do it in a week, but it takes me a year. But nevertheless, I learned one year to edit my own music. I learned to edit and share video another year. Learned to design my own websites. I learned to do my own graphics. This is one of the advantages of living a long time. Uh, I, I learned to program and operate a theatrical lighting for uh, all of the lighting in this place. And those you saw the show Thursday night, all of the different effects. I learned how to do all of that. I learned to work with Keynote and PowerPoint. And I, now my goal for this particular year is coming to better understand the matter of live streaming and webinars. But the point is, uh, we don't want to give up on ourselves. We want to say, I need to keep learning. So the goal of this presentation is to help us who use magic tricks to illustrate, illustrate spiritual truth to get a basic understanding of the technology that we need to be using now. We're going to be looking at things that are fundamental and essential this presentation will be guided by practicality. The world of technology is constantly changing. No matter what I teach today, someone will have a better idea tomorrow. Nobody can know everything about everything. It's easy to become overwhelmed and frustrated by the plethora of details. So I'm going to do my best not to have that happen today. I know you're not here to become technological experts, but we are here to learn how to get the job done and the job is that of successfully bringing God's truth to modern audiences. Therefore, 
we are going to do our best to cover four major concepts. Number one, technology in relation to music and sound. Number two, technology in relation to video. Number three, technology in relation to lighting. Number four, technology in relation to marketing and promotion. And again, I want to say with all these things is that there's no way that we can become thoroughly educated in a couple hours together on all this material. So the goal is not for us all to master it here and now. Some of this stuff took me a year or more to figure out. But the goal is to help us understand the direction we need to go and the things that are worth our time to try to learn, to try to figure out, and maybe also will suggest some of the things that are not smart, smart to waste money. We'll put much time on. So number one, we begin with the matter of technology in relation to music and sound. And we're going to start with the whole idea that as much as possible you need to control the plane of your own music and the volume of your own microphone. Uh, we don't want to be in a situation where we're trusting the sound man to get everything right. And if you stop and think about it, it can be a compliment to us as to why sound people mess up at our shows. And that is, we are a visual presentation. They get caught up in watching what we do to the point that they forget the cues. If we're really doing a good job, they're going to totally forget what they're supposed to do back there. But that peeves me when that happens. And then you do get sound people who have problems with ego and insist on trying to do it their way and it messes up what you're trying to do your way and some who simply don't know what they're doing. Uh, one of the biggest laughs I ever heard in my life happened at a pastor's conference at Moody Bible Institute some years ago. Uh, I do not remember what led the speaker to make the comment, but in the course of his presentation, there were about 700 pastors there, he said, when Satan fell from heaven, he landed in the sound booth of the local church. <laughs> <laughs> and the place just roared, and I think the reason why is everybody could relate. Uh, I, I could give you a huge <coughs> list of problems I've had, nightmares with sound. I was performing for the Children's Pastors Conference in Denver, Colorado a number of years ago, and it was at a hotel that was a union hotel, so they had to hire a union sound man. Well, I didn't know it, and nobody else knew it until my show started, but he showed up really drunk. And what he did with my sound that night was just awful. So terribly loud, he missed the cues, on it went, nobody could do anything about it, and it, it all but ruined the show. Now, a sound man, whether he's drunk or sober, he can give you problems, and I'm not putting sound men down. I know some churches have awesome sound people, and now and then I'll show up somewhere and I realize I can trust this guy. I'll let him do it. But the point is, the easiest way to avoid problems in the sound booth is to manage our own cues and volume. So how do we do that? I'm going to give you the best tool I have found for me. And that is to use your laptop and use Keynote or PowerPoint to run your music. Um, I'm in a situation where both of my laptops are in use. One's, writing the, one's the light, running the lighting, one's running the sound. Uh, did anyone else, did Robert or Aaron, I didn't think to ask you, do either of you have a laptop here? Yeah. Um, I don't but, get out of the but do you have do you have a PowerPoint or a, a, a keynote sort of thing on it? You probably don't. Not yet. Okay. Well, I'll try to explain it without it then. And if we need to get my laptop out later, I'll look at it and show you. Uh, I'll explain what I mean. But first, let me explain the advantages. So keynote and PowerPoint is what I'm using right now on the screen. But here's the thing: to run your show, you don't put it on the screen. You're not using it for. You're using the program. <coughs> without the projection. Now, if you want to add video in, you can. But So I'm not talking about playing it for people to see. I'm talking about the program itself. And the advantages are, first of all, you probably already have a laptop, and you probably all already have the program on it. You can get it on. Um, when you use PowerPoint or Keynote, the songs stop on their own. You don't have to worry about it playing into the next thing, because you, each individual slide is you put the music in for that slide. And I'm going to give you an example in just a minute so you'll see. But what's even better is you can set the volume for each song individually. You can go into each slide and click on and set the volume. So what we do before our show is we listen to the music and we set the volume for the entire show, every song, volumes are different, 
And uh, that way the sound man doesn't have to be back there running the lever up and pulling it down again. Once we're hooked up, I just say, leave it alone, we've got it already done. You can change the volume on the computer while maintaining the individual song setting. In other words, all the songs are, the volume is, matches each other perfectly, but you can take the overall volume of the computer if you decide it's not loud enough, bring it up, or if it's too loud, bring it down. So it's just extremely practical. You can operate it with an inexpensive remote control. That's what I'm doing right now. Those of you who saw my lecture last night, I did my whole lecture with this thing. It was just in my box, and I would reach over and just hit the button like that, and it would jump to the next thing. Um, so those are advantages. All that needs to be done is push the space bar. Nothing else to do. Just push the space bar. So if you, I, you know, Mary and I are always together. So Mary's backstage, just tap, and then the next one's up. Now the great thing is backstage, she can see the screen, so the screen tells her the song that's on that, that screen, it tells her the song is coming next, and the cue's all written there. So it works perfectly, and uh, if, if Mary's not there, I can use this remote control out of my magic stand. Just tap it, and I'm in complete control of music. The disadvantages, if you don't have a laptop, it can be expensive, and you have to carry a laptop with you. And uh, I realize this really does challenge you on the expense side, but I'm always worried I'm going to forget my laptop or drop my laptop or whatever, so I have a separate laptop for shows that I take with me. And I just went to, uh, I'm a Mac guy, so I went to Simply Mac, and they have these refurbished ones. And I know that the only thing I'm going to do is use it for my show, so I don't need any bells and whistles. I just want the cheapest laptop you've got. It's Mac friendly because that's what I know, and that's that's how we that's what we do for our show. So here's what it looks like backstage. So, and again, we don't. If you don't know how to do PowerPoint keynote, then this becomes one of your goals. I'm going to learn how to do this thing. But uh, if you were backstage looking on our laptop for our show, this is the the screen that's up before the show starts when it's time for pre-show music, and it's soft here in the background. Because people are going to talk over it, I don't want the pre-show music to bother them. So that's pre-show music, we're great, okay? Time for the person to host us, music goes off. And that's what Mary sees back there on the screen. It turns up Blamo through Fire Cage, that's going to be our opening act. A note to Mary, remember to close your curtain at the end of the set. And when the cue is said... The magician you are about to see has performed on five continents. Goes into the introduction, goes right into the music. I don't want you to have to listen to all this thing, but I want to make a point, and that is, this is much louder than the pre-show screen. Remember the pre-show screen was soft? I haven't had to touch anything, because all the volume is preset on the screens. This is such a cool start. We'll go ahead and let this guy finish up. The <laughs> And I'll also tell you, we do have this vocal introduction. I'll tell you why in a moment. So from there, but you can see the volume is much different. Now, I'm going to quickly tell you about that, that introduction. I've been in communication with Josh J, and Josh is just a great mind in magic and a wonderful young man. But Josh had been doing some research on things that help people remember you as <coughs> magic, you know, what makes a good impression. And uh, he did a little presentation on this a while back, and I would never, never in my wildest dreams have guessed what he discovered was the thing that was most important in having people remember you as a credible performer. An introduction. They, they did a, it was done actually with a college, it was done like a, like a major study with test groups and the whole works. So people that were introduced, and if a routine was introduced, it was remembered much with much greater appreciation. For some reason, you tell people it's good, they, then they, they, they say, well, it must be good, and they remember it as good. And so that's why, like, leading into my Silk Act, I have this little one-minute introduction about the awards I won. I don't want to brag on myself. I, you know, I, I'm concerned. I don't want to come across as toot my own horn. But I realize, on the other hand, people need to know that they're seeing something special, and they need a frame of reference. And sometimes they, they really, they've never seen magic. They don't know one magician from another. And so you mentioned these different things you've done. And they say, hey, well, this, this must be good. And so we built that one-minute introduction into our performance. And I, I try real hard to walk that line of not, not sounding like I'm tooting my own horn. 
and, and shown off by credits, but on the other hand, saying to people, this is something special. You're going to see something you don't see every day because that creates greater appreciation. So enough said on that. So anyway, so um, our, our opening set is done. The music quits on its own. Mary, you know, nobody has to push stop. When it's done, it's done. Screen comes up, so Mary knows, okay, the next thing up is linking ropes. The cue is three ring illusion. When Dwayne says three ring illusion, she hits the button, and the music is set to be soft because I talk over this trick, and away we go. After that, flying box is next. You know, all you do is hit it. And it's going to be a whole lot louder and so on. So um, that's the basic idea. And what I'm recommending then is that the easiest way to learn to master your music is just put it into a laptop, PowerPoint, or Keynote program. Each slide, each routine is a separate slide. So it has its own music, its own volume, it starts and stops, hit the button or hit the remote. This particular clicker... I will tell you, I learned the hard way. I ordered off Amazon a clicker for my laptop top for $8.95. Amen. Yes. And it was a piece of junk. And if I walked more than 10 feet away, it didn't do anything. And sometimes when I was right next to it, it didn't do anything. So this one cost me 40 bucks. But it's called Kensington. You can look at it later. But you know, just you put a little USB thing in the USB of your computer. And this thing, I, I don't know what the distance is. I've never walked so far away that this won't work. So anyway, that's how we do it. Yes, sir. I'm saying, uh, yes, it's Microsoft PowerPoint. Yeah, Microsoft. So if you're PC guy, PowerPoint. Yeah, and it'll do the same thing. Yeah, so what you do, and again, I, I'm trying not to get into too much detail because <laughs> all we're going to cover, but what you do is you take your song, uh, iTunes or wherever you get it, it's going to be in an MP3 form. And you just, you, you get your PowerPoint up and you just drag it into the slide. And when you drag it in, it's going to show you a little button. You click on the button, you can set the volume off on the side. It shows you how to slider to set the volume for it. You set the volume for it, you're done. And it's very simple, very practical. Then, PowerPoint, Keynote, two separate programs? Yes. Keynote is the Mac version of PowerPoint. But, you know, I say I really like my Mac, and what's neat is Mac <laughs> will recognize and work PowerPoint. For example, Jim Scott's seminar today, he's going to be on PowerPoint, and we're running through my Mac. Just put it in there, and away it goes. So it does work. But, so that's what I suggest. There's so much more. We can spend the whole day probably on that. But I want to keep moving, talking about remote systems for playing music through various devices. So you say, okay, Dwayne, you explain the laptop thing. And uh, believe me, it's the simplest way to do it, but that's not what you want to do. So what else is available? I'm not an expert on other things because I don't use the other things. But my son David, who is of a younger generation, and he flies to most of his shows, and rarely teaches with him sometimes, but a lot of times she isn't, so he has to be able to manage his music on his own. He uses something called Show Q combined with Audio 8. And he was here, and he explained it to me, and as he did, my eyes glazed over. It was... <laughs> yeah. and, and, I, and because I don't want to be a self-made dinosaur, if I needed it, I would learn to use it. But I knew I didn't need it, because what I'm doing with my laptop works so great, and Mary's a wonderful remote. She just hits the button. So, you know, I got it covered two ways. But anyway, those are things you could investigate, and there may be... I'm curious, does anybody here use either of those? It doesn't look like it, but those are things to investigate. David recommends them highly. I think he said all together, maybe cost about $500 to get both things. And ShowQ is, I think it's a free app. Uh, I'm not exactly uh, sure. If so, it's very minimal expense. It's under 100 bucks if it's not free. But the Audio 8 is the thing that he sets back by the soundboard that recognizes the ShowQ from a distance, if, if I understand it correctly. <coughs> So that's yeah. all I'm going to say about that. Can you discuss, because John had the rift operated, same thing with the clicker? Um, so yes, what he's talking about, when John did his uh, magic show for us on Thursday, he operated everything from a wrist device. And John, I, I meant to get that on the screen. What is the name of what you're using? Ultimate Control. He's using something called Ultimate Control. And uh, just a couple questions about it. Um, is it come complete? There's a receiver that goes to the soundboard and the thing on your wrist. And what is what are we talking price range on that? Um, 
You can't get that one anymore. Can't get it anymore, uh, okay. Uh, he might have some. This is through Happy Amper and Power okay. Sound. And uh, his new one uses a, uh, a tablet. Okay, but same thing. It's about $350. So somewhere in the three hundred dollar range for the yeah. whole works, and you can talk to John about that. But one of the things that has happened with technology, when I first started talking about different things, like I remember when mini disc was the answer. We went from CDs to mini disc. I have a couple friends that still use mini disc, but there wasn't there wasn't ten different ways to play it. There was basically this is a mini disc. This is what it does. Well, now the technology has so exploded that when it comes to remote systems, there are many of them out there, all kinds of things to use. So my suggestion is, whatever you can understand and work for you, uh, talk to somebody, they have a good experience, and learn how to do it, and just use it. The biggest point is there are things there. So John uses ultimate control. Anybody use anything else different here? Chris? I'm, I'm trying something. Uh, it's audio cues. And you can get a free version. Audio, uh, audio cues. And you can get a free version, and then you can pay, I think it's $6.99 if you want the professional version. Yeah. And it's it's Bluetooth, so if your speaker's Bluetooth enabled, it'll go directly from your phone. You can control it from your phone. Okay. So um, say it again. I want to make sure, because we're recording this. It's audio, audio cues. Audio cues. It's Mac. And it's a Mac product? Uh, no. No. no audio, audio cues, Android. though. Okay, Android, and it works off your phone, mm -hmm. and, it, and uh, there's a free version, and then for $6.95, there's a professional version. So you might check that out and see if that's something that you understand. You say, hey, that'll work for me. You might go with that. Uh, Aaron, Aaron's getting my attention back there. Uh, uh, Robert? Show through app. Are you finding something there? Uh, well, we think we've, we probably had it up there wrong. Oh, okay. Because we have SoundCue for app. Oh, the SoundCue is the app instead of ShowCue. Okay. It seems to be that way. I it haven't seems. found show okay. cue yet. Okay, so. if you can't find show cue, look up sound cue. But again, look at the third line. Then. The important thing is to learn to do something. And again, for me, uh, frankly, I've seen everything out there. That I said I haven't seen everything, but I mean I have seen everything that the people I know are using. Because I'm always curious, what are you doing for your sound? What are you doing for your sound? And I see a lot of things that work for a lot of people, but I have seen nothing that to me is more simple than setting it up on my laptop screen and pushing this little button. So while they're investigating to make sure I didn't steer you on the wrong path in any of that, we'll quickly talk about devices for playing your music. Obviously the laptop works, iPod or MP3 player. I do travel with my iPod for my small shows at resorts. And I'm assuming you know what an iPod is. It's a little thing and you put your music in playlist and away you go. Phone works great. Uh, the young people who work with me tease me all the time for my iPod. My iPod's pretty much my favorite toy ever. And they say, why do you need that? you got a phone. Well, I just like having the two things separate. And besides that, I'm a bad example when it comes to technology because I don't carry a phone and I don't use a phone. I have a good reason why, but we'll go into that right now. If you want to call me, you can call Mary. She'll find me. Um, CD does work, but we do need to face the reality CD is old school, and if you show up at churches with a CD, you're going to get places anymore where they won't be able to play it, or if they can play it, they're not going to be happy with it. Uh, we need to move on from CD technology. Robert, we, we, figured, we figured it out. Okay. Um, ShowQ is only for Apple products. ShowQ is for Apple products. For Apple products, and it's nine nine. Uh, $89.99. Show Q is for an Mac. Apple or Mac, and that's why David, because David's a Mac guy, yeah. so it's 89 So, and, and then the other one, I think that was the Android. And Sound Q. There's Sound Q and the other one that the you audio, have The audio Q is for PC yeah. and Android. Okay, okay. So, um, flash drive or thumb drive. Now, the problem with flash drive and thumb drive is you, you can't play the music from the flash drive and thumb drive. But I wanted to put that up there because I recommend putting all of your show music on a thumb drive, flash drive, whatever you call it, and always having it with you. So if something happens and your music gets lost, you at least have copies. In most places you go, they can pull the stuff off the flash drive and put it into the page. <coughs> and that leads me to this. This is a very uh, practical takeaway idea, and I'm completely serious about it. Completely serious. Travel with three ways to play your music at least. Do not arrive with one thing. 
and assume it's going to work. You arrive with a CD, and if their thing won't read it, or your CD got scratched, you're sunk. So um, I travel with my laptop, I travel with my iPod, I travel with uh, usually a, a um, I always have stuff on the thumb drive, and my mind's skipping, what's my third thing? Uh, oh, it is, it is on the uh, on a phone, of course, so we have that, but there's something else, and I'll think of it later. But anyway, I always travel with three different ways to play my music, three different sources. And uh, if you're going to do church programs, uh, I think it's a big mistake if you don't do that. So, moving along, we are going to take a break and have feedback in here, but I'm just trying to stay on track. Um, you also wise to carry adapters. Now, that if you have your own system, fine. But you're going to get places where you want to plug into their system. And a, one thing that is really important that you only will learn the hard way, but this is an adapter from a quarter-inch jack to what's called XLR. And I'll leave it on the front of the stage so you can look at it. And what it does is it takes one of these and changes it so this can attach to a microphone cord or to a sound box back there. You will get places where if you're just running this out of your iPod or out of your computer, this is an eighth inch jack, and you go to jack it in with this, they're not going to get full sound. Because some systems are not stereo. And so it's only going to pick up one channel and it's going to be muddy or the volume's not going to be good, you're going to wonder what's wrong. If you use this adapter, then what it does is it puts it to both channels so you get a full strength signal. So I always travel with one of these. I always travel with an 8 inch to quarter inch. Uh, I just travel with a little thing. Basically, every adapter I can find, I have with because, as I say, nowadays technology is so different. And along with the churches that are on cutting edge, there are those churches that are still in the dark ages. You're going to show up, and all they have is a CD player or whatever. So you kind of have to be aware of everything. I always travel with a long mic cord. Now XLR means that this kind of ending is used and it's a big long mic cord. The reason for that is um, I need to get to their sound system somehow. And what I do is I go out of my laptop, I go into a mic cord, and then the mic cord allows me to, to connect to whatever their mic jacks are, wherever they are. And excuse me to step out of sight for just a minute, but I'm going to show you this, and it will be worth seeing. For our big illusion shows, this is our sound system. Now, I always carry backup if I can't use the house sound. But normally in theaters, I can use their sound. And this is designed, so it just pops open. The video may not see it, Aaron, but we won't worry about that right now. And it's, it's going to look like a mess to you. But what I have is a mixer in here. And then my microphone is in there as well. And they go into the mixer. And then we come out with this. And we just go into a microphone, wherever it is. And then we control all of our sound for the whole house out of that. And I will say more about that in a minute. But the point is, uh, one of the reasons I need the adapters is, and the long mic cord is to make sure I can connect this to the house system. And once I do that, I've got the control. So I want the 8 inch to quarter inch, 1 eighth to 1 eighth. Uh, it used to be that uh, most uh, sound systems did not have a means of taking this smaller thing. This is the what you put into the headphone for your phone or your player. But a lot of places now have this have uh, an eighth inch jack. In fact, I've got a speaker I'm going to show you in a minute. It's actually got eighth inch on to, to, to go into because they're catching up with the use of digital devices. And um, yeah, so I guess that's all I want to say about adapters. But I do want to talk about this. Travel with a test speaker. These used to cost about $45. Now you can get them at Guitar Center for $20, bucks, but you don't need this. You can go to Walmart and for under $10, just get any little kind of speaker that you can plug into your sound system. And here's why. If sound isn't working, as far as the local venue is concerned, it's always your fault. <laughs> Uh, we just did our big tour, major cities across the Midwest. The first three places we were, I set up my sound and it wouldn't work. And in each place, the professional sound man said, something is wrong with your system. They always say it. And I want to say to them, 
I do this show every night of the week, month after month. I know this works, but that's not good for relation. So what I do is I plug this into the output of my sound system. I plug this in. I turn on my little speaker. I'll go get an iPod so you can hear it. But normally this would be coming out of my sound system. And I say, look, the music is clearly going, clearly going from there to here. It works to here. Well, at this point, it goes into your system, which means the problem has to be from here on. Because it's working from, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So I always carry a very inexpensive speaker. So if they're saying something's wrong, and believe me, they're always, the first thought is going to be, you're, you're, something's wrong with what you've got. I just can pop that in and say, nope, we got sound to here. So if it's, if it's to here, then we know the problem has to be from here on. And then they look at their system, and they usually don't want to admit it, but it turns out there was a button they forgot to push, or there was something else. And of course, in the theater situation, many of these people, they have like three or four different ones that do it, and whoever's week it is changes it, so the guy who shows up the next week doesn't know what the guy the previous week changed, and I'm the guy who stands in the middle of it trying to you know, get that all figured out. But anyway, I uh, do very much recommend traveling with some sort of test speaker on that. Now we're talking about microphones, and we are moving quickly, but I'm going to do my best to give you a chance to, to we'll slow down later so you can absorb all this. Um, microphones are a matter of personal preference. I use a handheld wireless for most shows, which is this. You saw our illusion show Thursday night. You saw me using that. Um, I use it for a number of reasons. First of all, I'm very comfortable with it because I've done it for so many years. Secondly, I'm very active. You know, I'm jumping in and out of props. I'm catching girls and so on. And a microphone attached to my body. The cords can get caught, and it's just inconvenient. Thirdly, I do a ton of jacket changes in show and shirt changes. And one of the biggest reasons why is I sweat so much that I would soak through a suit if I wore one suit the whole time. And by changing in and out, I keep my garments fresh, and so they last a lot longer in tour, but also uh, the production value of different costuming, I think, uh, is something that's good for the show. So anyway, being able to go over, grab this mic, and uh, say what I need to say, do what I need to do, and put it back works very well for me. The other thing I like about this is the fact that I'm in control. I'm going to shut off my remote for my laptop for lapel for a moment. So I can, I can have it here, and you're picking up my voice, but if I want to say something to a spectator, or maybe quickly say something to one of the ladies or Mary that I forgot something, I can just turn away from it. And if it's wired right here, I can't get away from it. So those are some of the reasons I like that. This is an Audio-Technica mic. It costs around 300 bucks. Uh, it is my favorite mic for my style, and the reason is the mute is on the bottom, and this is the mute. That's it. So when I'm setting it aside, I've got to mute it, or it's going to feed back into the speaker. But when I go to set it aside, my little finger just hit the bottom like that, it's off. When I pick it up after the routine, start again, just hit the bottom, it's on. So I love that particular aspect of it. But certainly, this is not the only answer. Get my lapel back on. I do use a lapel for situations like this where I'm teaching, but also in my kid shows and my, my resort shows where I'm not doing jacket changes and I'm not jumping in and out of props, then this is much more convenient. But again, for me, I like the lapel because when I'm doing the resort shows or whatever, uh, I'm about ready to walk on, and I notice a prop or something, and I need to say something to Mary, but I don't want to hear the public. I don't want them to hear what I'm saying. So I can just put my hand over it for a moment. So it allows me that control. I can kind of self-mute to say something quickly, and then I can go on. But that, that's not the best way for everyone. It's my way. Uh, my son, David, uses a countryman mic, which means it's the flesh-colored mic that goes over your ear and out this way. I have a lot of performing friends who use those and love them. So I would never say that you're wrong if you use a countryman. You need to use what I use. I would never say that because we have different styles. But I'm saying for my style, one thing works. For him, that works. Then John, just John, showed us a uh, setup with, would you say the name of it again? Uh, higher, P Y. R -E. A pile. Was it pile? P-Y-R-E. P-Y-R-E. 
and it, it goes into a lapel sending unit, but the mic itself, the verse of the countryman, several hundred dollars. He said the pyre was $24? 24 to 28, depending on the connector from B&H. 24 to 28, it was from B&H. Video. From B&H Video. And it, it, I thought it was tremendous. When he did his show for us Thursday, I, you know, the sound was perfect. And so, you know, if you can get something for under 30 bucks, why spend 300? So, um, that, that's, you know, we're not, we could say, we could say so much about microphones, but basically, I've had good success. But here's a point, and my son David mentioned this to me, and I thought it was a great insight. He said, magicians will spend $300 on a prop they're going to use for three minutes of the show. But they won't spend $300 on a microphone that they're going to use for the entire show, and every show. You know, what are we thinking? Uh, but the problem is we want to play with our toys and we get so excited about this cool little box that we aren't always very practical. And uh, I, don't, I don't think you need to spend $800 or $1,000. If you have that kind of money and want to, you can. But I've stayed, the, uh, I just stick with what works. I've had good success. This is an audio technical lapel mic and I got this thing for I think under $200, the whole setup. Uh, the handheld was around 300. I've had great success with them. I use them forever, and so I'm. I'm not saying it's the best. I'm just saying it's worked for me. John? Yeah, yeah. When I say 28 dollars, that's for the microphone. That's for the, the microphone. Body pack. I use the Sennheiser. Oh, okay. That's 350. So, so okay, the 20. <laughs> but the Countryman microphone. It's, it's the 20... Countryman microphone sure. is 350. Right. It's a 24 dollar microphone, but you have to have a 350 dollar right. sending unit. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> but what he was saying, though, the country and mic needs that same sending unit, yeah. but it's a three hundred dollar mic, so you're still saving a lot. So uh, obviously, you know, you remember quality is what you want to consider uh, over price. Quality is the thing that stares you in the face forever. Price gets quickly forgotten. Get good things, but I think it's usually safe to go middle of the road. You don't want the least expensive. I used to use the Nady mics, M A D Y, when I first started. It was new, wireless. It was pretty good. Then they went to China to get them mass produced because they were so popular and they were junk. And I had bad experiences with Navy, so I wouldn't use Navy again. That's just been my experience. But uh, what I'm saying is, I wouldn't go the lowest end, but there's not a need to go the highest end either. Usually middle of the road, you can find something that is pretty good. Now, the mixer is, a, a if you want to totally control your own sound, it's a great thing to know about. I'm going to lift this out. So this is part of our house sound system. And uh, I got this for $49. And uh, you can find it on Amazon or whatever for that kind of price. The, and I'll leave it here so you can check at the break. But uh, it, you don't need a big mixer as a magician because a magician, all you have to do is have one thing to put your music in and another thing to put your mic in. Now, gospel quartets and singing groups need a whole bunch of things. They need a great big mixer because they have instruments and everything else. But we can get by with one for about $49. But what the advantage of this is, this sets my microphone volume, this sets my music volume. So I preset both, so my, my music volume is set on this, and of course the computer's matched all the volumes where I want. My microphone is with this, so the sound man can't really adjust my microphone without adjusting my music. I just tell him, once we have a volume setting, leave it alone back there. If I don't like my mic volume, Mary can turn me up or turn me down. So this little thing gives me complete control. So my, my music player, or my laptop runs into here. My, my mic runs into here. It comes out of here into the house sound system or into my own sound system I have, I have to use that. We'll keep going. I would love to get through the music section, this first thing, then we'll cover the other three this afternoon. And I'm going to leave this stuff to you look at it more closely. Personal sound systems. I always travel with my own sound. I hope I don't need to use it because it's a headache to set it up. But you would not believe how many times I end up needing to use it. They don't understand their own system. There's problems. Sometimes I'll get there and I can tell the sound man's going to give me grief. He may not mean to, but here's one of the, the things most commonly happens with the sound men, even in churches. I go in, I say, all we have to do is set our sound to one level. We have one channel, one level, let's get it right. So he turns the button, let's get everything all balanced. Okay, we got it, wonderful. And he grabs the button and turns it down. And I say, well, you know, we just got it right. Oh, I'll remember. No, he won't. 
And so they introduced me and Dwayne Laughlin, and there's no sound. Because he forgot to turn it on. And then he doesn't remember the exact, he just wants to justify his existence by playing with knobs. And, you know, I, if you, you detect a little bit of uh, frustration in that statement, it's because I've had a lot of experiences that have really tested my spirituality. <laughs> so, so I just do everything I can to, to make a thrill. So anyway, they'll grab it down. So if I, if I have that set on them, and if I can convince them to leave it alone, then I can turn, and I don't have to worry because I'm not going to turn myself down. You know, I'm going to keep myself ready to go. So enough said on that. But a personal sound system, um, I want to show you something very simple. Forgive me for stepping out of sight, but it's the only way to do this lecture. And here again, the, tech, the world of technology has changed drastically. It used to be there were very few options, and now there are so many options, we don't really quite know what to do. And one of the things that is changed, and it took me a while to mentally adjust to this, I've got to plug this in, it used to be you needed an amplifier. Remember the days? A speaker was, you know, it, it didn't work unless you had something to plug your power into. Well now, speakers are self-amplified. I paid um, 119 for this. Now I have a much bigger one that is the backup sound system for our illusion show. And it cost me $179, got a Sam's Club, and I've used it in theaters of 800 people. It does work great. I'll get someplace, I don't like their sound, or I know I'm going to have trouble with the sound man, and so I just plug in that box and it works. But this is what I basically travel with for resorts or just something small. And uh, remember when I was telling you about the eighth inch hookup here? Well, this has got uh, a place in the back for the eighth inch hook, so here goes my iPod. So when I show up for the show, I'm trying to find a song that would be a little bit more exciting here. This isn't great, but anyway. When I show up for the show, all I have to do is plug this in, my iPod goes into it, and the sending unit for my microphone goes into the mic unit. And for the resort show, that's it. And, oh great, that song doesn't start loud. I shouldn't have been better prepared for music. Let me find some show music for you. Okay, this isn't show music, but this will do the job. Here we go. Best part of the thing is watching Dwayne push buttons. <laughs> round, round, get around, get around, get around, round, round, I get around, get around, round, round, I get around. So you get the idea of the kind of volume. It's relatively inexpensive, but it's got nice volume, nice sound quality, and so I mean, all I have, to, so my little mic sending unit is about this big, and so I have a box, and this goes into a little mic sending unit, the cord for my iPod or my laptop, and I've got portable sound for small situations. And then I just went with a much bigger one. Yes, John? I just wanted to say, I saw the name, I quick look. The microphone is Pyle. It is, it's not Pyle. It is P-Y-L-E. I thought it might be Pyle. But I would, here's the other thing I do. So when we do the illusion shows, we travel with the great big version, and if you want to see it, I can dig it out for you later. And this, because this becomes our backstage monitor. So we put this behind the curtain, out of the monitor thing, and it's a great monitor. So it, it gives us whatever I need to hear for the sound off stage, and the other one carries the sound on stage. But it's amazing. No big amp, no big, no big things, but one little mixture like that. It's that board, two powered speakers, and we basically can do whatever we want pretty much in any situation. Yes? Does that mean you've left PowerPoint behind or what? No, no, no. Um, his question is, does that mean I've left PowerPoint and Keynote behind? No. Um, I, I almost always have the laptop in PowerPoint, but there are some situations. For example, we do a resort here called Treasure Lake, and it's just 20 minutes across town, and, and we're there quite often. And I know the setup, and it's simple, and I just go over and, you know, I just plug in my iPod, and I do the music that way. And because we, we go over there, I, I do different shows for them, and so the iPod is an easy way to, to, to quickly reset my playlist and such. But good question. Okay, uh, still on the subject of music, just a couple other things to deal with. Should your music be royalty free? And the answer to that question depends on your situation. Mary and I pay for the use of all the music in our shows. We pay ASCAP, we pay BMI. It's not as expensive as you would think. 
uh, probably thousand bucks a year is what it adds up to somewhere in there for our, our situation. But um, you don't need to do that. The issue is if somebody is hiring you or if a church is giving you an offering or whatever, they are responsible for royalties and rights for any music. You're in a school, you're in a theater, it's their job to pay that stuff, not yours. So by and large, you're, you're free to use anything you want because they're the ones that are supposed to be taking care of this. However, now and then you will run into an organization that says, we don't pay these rights, you need to have taken care of what you use or it needs to be royalty free. I've had that happen just a couple of times. But, the re but, but even there, there if, if there was a lawsuit, they'd be the ones in trouble, not me. It is their responsibility. So normally, normal people don't really need to worry about it. But if you're going to do anything for YouTube or commercial purposes, royalties need to be paid. Um, great sources, audiojungle.com or .net, audiojungle.net. And there you're going to pay anywhere from $19 to $49 for a song. But think about it. You think that's a lot, but it's not. You're paying for the rights to use that music anywhere, anytime, the rest of your life. And someone else did the work to create it. They should be compensated for it. So um, it's it's great. Then Arthur Stead, and you go to is it ArthurStead.com is his website. Arthur has produced a lot of royalty-free music for magicians and gospel magicians, and it's just a tremendous resource. But the point with the royalty-free, guess I'll back up for just a minute, is if you can find stuff you like that's royalty-free, it's the best choice because then you don't ever have to worry about getting somewhere where you can't use it. Whereas if your music is not royalty free and you produce your own show like we did Thursday night, if ASCAP or BMI had come in and I was not paying the rights to my music, I would have been in trouble for Thursday night because I produced that particular event. So if it's your event and you're in charge of it, then you've got to, you're responsible. And that's where the royalty free is nice. If you know how to work a garage band or a good music editing program, you can create your own music. Aaron has created some songs for things, haven't you Aaron? Just by taking the loops in GarageBand and putting them together. So even if you're not a musician, you can compose some music. Quickly, editing music, GarageBand, if you're a Mac guy, is wonderful. And going back to, remember what I said at the start, I give myself each year a new thing to learn. Because I am an older guy when it comes to you know modern technology, and I don't have the experience that young people do, I, I can't learn this stuff fast. And I'll admit, I have my frustrations. But I get it. And I've learned to work GarageBand, and I'm very happy with what I do with GarageBand. Audacity is a good program if you want to try. Is it free? Does anybody know? I, th yeah. I think it's... Yeah. Yes. There's a free version, but it sounds, if you try and put it onto an MP3, onto a flash drive, it likes to, the free one likes to write Audacity said through the song, throughout sure. the song. Sure. So it is worth buying to get rid of it. There is a free version, but it's best to go ahead and buy it if you really want to use it a lot. But my point in putting these two up here again, there's a lot, you go on the internet, all kinds of programs out there. And what I'm trying to do is be helpful to tell you sometimes to look at all these things and I don't know which one's good, which one isn't, because they all claim they're the best. Yeah. And so I like knowing, somebody said, I use GarageBand, works awesome. I saw a lot of people told me they used Audacity, works awesome. And those are the two I know about, so those are the two I mentioned. Chris? I use a thing that is a more expensive program, there's different levels of it, but if you know a little bit about music, and you, but you want to create your own feel, it's called Band in a Box. Band in a Box. Yeah, and it's, it's really nice. You put the chords in or whatever, and what style you want, and you can create whatever you want in the Super. music sure. Wow. So there is a program called Band in the Box as well. I'll take a couple more hands, and then we're going to try to, to move to the end of this. Yes? Uh, Soundwave. Soundwave? Yeah, uh, it's about $180, but it's... You can add tracks, you can Sound expand, wave. decrease, you can... So that's worked that's work for you too? Yeah, excellent. Yes. So a lot of things out there, but again, you know, I, I'm not pushing Mac, because you know, I know that you know, it's two different worlds. But the great thing about Mac is nothing compares to GarageBand that I know. You know, it just comes with a computer and it's just awesome. But otherwise, PC World has a lot of choices. And, Audacity, Soundwave, whatever, uh, and you can talk during the break about this more. Quick tip, again, I wanted to try to give you a practical thing, a simple tip. So if you're making an edit and you're new at it and you're not really that skilled and so your edit's fairly rough, cover the sound effect with a cymbal crash or, or cover the edit with some other thing. I'm going to give you an example. Our sub-trunk routine that we did Thursday night is a total of two minutes worth of music. 
the song was five and a half or five and a half minutes. I had to cut the song way down. So let's see if you can hear where I did the edit. Maybe you should turn that up for a little bit. Should be coming soon. <laughs> I thought it came quicker than that, maybe. Oh, there it was. Did you hear the little laser shot? Yeah. That meant I just skipped two minutes worth of music. <laughs> but the edit was a little bit rough, so I put the laser shot in at the same time and it covered the, the rough edit. And this is a, you know, all he has two minutes, I don't want you to listen all the way through. But toward the end, I also put in, um, when I'm learning the music, I don't need it, when I, but when I'm learning, you know, I want to finish on time. So I will put cymbal crashes in that's 30 seconds out, 20 seconds out, 10 seconds out. So they're, they're music cues to me. I know I've got 30 seconds left, I've got 20 seconds left, I've got 10 seconds left, I'm going to hit the pose. And once I've learned the music, I don't need that, but that's, that's another technique I use. And it's super simple to do that stuff once you learn an editing program. Pre-show and post-show playlists. We use 40 minutes pre-show. We use 10 minutes for post-show. There's, there's no magic number there. That just happens to be what we do. Uh, post-show, you, you don't need too much music because folks are going to be visiting and so on. Uh, music for getting volunteers. Loop it or know your time. Loop it means you set it so it never stops until you push stop. Otherwise, what I, I've learned, I know how long it takes and I know, you know, getting into a normal audience, you know, what, what it's going to be out and back, and so I'll edit a song. Usually 40 seconds is what I need for a <coughs> So I design my music that way, so, so it, because on the laptop, it's going to end at 40 seconds, and I'm going to be back up on stage, and so there's no buttons to push. And I think that's the uh, code, that uh, we did it. So we covered everything I wanted to say about music, and we stayed somewhat close to the schedule. Dr. Chris Beck is here, Aaron is here, and I would like each of the two of you to quickly come up, and I'm actually right on time, this is awesome, but if the two of you would quickly come up and just add a couple thoughts to what I've said, if you're willing to do that. Yes. How, how long do I allow for setup of the whole show or setup of the music? The, um, you check even for the big illusion show, I can have the music ready to go in 10 minutes. Because all I have to do is open that box and find a, a jack to run my XLR for you. Because that's the great thing, of, I'll just give you that, it's muted right now. It's the great thing about the mixer. My volumes are set. In the computer, everything is set. So the only thing I need is to jack into the house sound and do them one volume set back in their thing. So it's really, really nice. And then, if, of course, it's my own thing. Since my volumes are set in the computer compared to one another, I don't have to do that. All I have to do is do one volume set on this. And so, and I, oh, I, oh, good, here's a, a good answer on that. So what I do is I take my loudest song. I play my loudest song, and we say, okay, what would be too loud? Don't want to go beyond that. So we set it at maximum volume, and everything else will be right when I do it. So you play your loudest song, do one level set, you're done. Dr. Chris Beck is Dean of Education at Baptist Bible College. He's going to share a couple things. Aaron's going to share a couple. Mary was waving at me. What did you want us to know, huh? No, I just wanted, wanted to know when your break time was going to be. Okay, the, as soon as these two guys are done, and they won't be very long, we'll have cookies and things out for people to snack on, too. So, Chris? Mine's pretty, mine's pretty quick. Uh, a couple things, and, and I know some of you probably already do this, but for me, I, Dwayne mentioned this, I Google when I don't know what to do. Uh, anymore, that's the quickest way to find an answer, and I can usually find what I don't know what to do on any of this software. One other thing I will mention about PowerPoint, and I make the assumption about Keynote, but I'm not sure. Uh, PowerPoint allows you to save your video presentation, at, I'm sorry, your PowerPoint presentation as a video. And so you can write from PowerPoint whatever you create with all the transitions and, and pretty fancy stuff. Uh, you can save that as a video. And then you, what I do is I, I take that into uh, Movie Maker, and then I may edit it some more and do some other things with it. But it's really <coughs> neat, and it was something that I kind of, I think I learned that on accident. I don't know that anybody told me, uh, but it's really cool. There are a lot of options in terms of saving PowerPoint presentations. 
Uh, for us, I would just mention. This is, am I good? Yes. Yes. All right. For us, um, I'll, I'll just mention because of PowerPoint things like that. A lot of times it's just my wife and I, so we just tend to use the iPod, and I just put a blank track in between so that if it happens to run, I know we got this. And then sometimes, whenever we uh, ran our own theater, and I knew we wouldn't have time to do that. I actually just press play, and the music would run for approximately 30 minutes with blank spots and everything in it. I mean, I just had it timed that way, so that I knew that this joke was going to take 30 seconds. And so, and then the music would start as I go to get someone, and so I would just literally press play, and the music would run for 30 seconds in a row. So well, you actually had a script and knew what you were going to say? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, go ahead, please. I would also mention, for me, I travel with a suitcase that is literally everything is locked into it just like this with the soundboard, everything. It has an out cord and a plug-in cord, and I literally plug that in and one cord comes out and plugs into the house system. That's it. It takes no time whatsoever to set up. And you, you were talking about this earlier. It's the same thing with this. You have this set and you could just plug this plug right, right into the back. Yep. Just one plug. You don't, it, your laptop, all that runs runs this as well. Yes, it does. Because I have a speaker like this and a, and a uh, literally on wheels, a suitcase, and I just wheel it in and plug it in. And I'll uh, say that my suitcase is a big mess because I pulled stuff out to show you and I'm readjusting it for a tour. But normally we use foam and everything's exactly in place and like Aaron said, one thing plugs in, another thing goes out to the house sound and we're ready to go. Chris, don't you, you said you use PowerPoint in your preaching and stuff too. Oh, I right? use PowerPoint Every sermon, I use a PowerPoint. Usually on Sunday mornings, I use at least three videos as illustrations during the message. And uh, you mentioned it, I, I think your lecture was the Thursday morning. Uh, but you um, talked about the need to get people's attention back. Yes, yes. And that's what my illustrations on my videos are. Uh, and I play a video, they start watching again. Uh, then I talked about. Ten minutes or so, and they tune out. Their eyes play so over. So, and so, and so, and video. Video. <laughs> so but, yeah, I use it. I use it every every uh, oh. sermon. Okay, this was a huge amount of material, but I hopefully that we we got you thinking about what direction to go. We'll take uh, Richard's question. Is it Rich or Richard? Richard. Yeah. Richard. We'll take Richard's question. Then at the break, you can come up and look at things if you want. Talk amongst yourselves. Give me some feedback so if I know anything needs to be clarified. So, Richard? Yeah, what size audience uh, plays with that type of a speaker? How large? Okay, here is the one problem. You buy these things on Amazon. You really don't know the quality. Let's say I paid 119 for this. It'll easily play 50 to 100 people. But um, it, it, but it doesn't have as much volume as I expected. But it's great for my resort shows and my small little things. Uh, but the, the the next one up, and believe it or not, I got a Sam's Club, 179. And uh, you know, Robert will tell you on tour, we set that baby up in a lot of places. Uh, place, place. I don't think we ever set it up in a place that would maybe seat more than 800. But it was better than the house system in most places. That was yeah, it, it carries nice, really nice. There. You really think it's their sound system. I'm very oh, pleased. So, Robert, what are you saying? Uh, for people watching, I got it live streaming. Oh, it's um, live streaming. Are yes. you going to have the notes on your website? Um, I'll not? try. Okay. Uh, that's why we're videoing it. We may try to post this whole thing on YouTube. Okay. Uh, but I do have it all written out in my notes, but I don't know how helpful the notes would be to other people. But if, they, if it looks like it'd be helpful, I'll get okay. copies. Okay. <laughs> um, Aaron or Chris, anything else to add to this right now? Then we'll take a break, uh, then we'll get back on course. We're going to play with some magic tricks and stuff for the next 45 minutes after the break. And then we'll get back to technology in the afternoon. Mary? Cookies are over on this table. Coffee's over on this table. And Travis will be back here to sell you a pop or water if you want that. There's also free water in this container right here. Okay. And I also I got the keynotes on my laptop if they want to see what it looks oh, like. Oh, so again, if you want to see, if you want to see what the programs look like, Robert will show it to his laptop. Same